All right, I think we can start now. Uh, so welcome colleagues, uh, welcome also also um, to uh, this uh, webinar today um, on uh, skills ecosystems. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce you, Osolio Kovac, uh, who is an associate director at the Boston Consulting Group in Zurich, uh, where she's supporting organizations in preparing their workforces for the future, which is obviously right what we need here uh, today. She's currently researching innovative ways to solve the global skills crisis as an ambassador at BCG Henderson Institute. Uh, and um, maybe just you know, for your information as well, she, so she previously worked at the World Economic Forum, supporting development and executive world-class leadership program, the Global Leadership Fellows. She's also a former global director, IESEC mm -hmm. International, the largest world's, uh, world's largest youth-run organization. Uh, and so we are, it's a great pleasure to have you here today with us also. Uh, my colleague, uh, Daniel Saman, who is also in the, in the room, will provide some, uh, some feedback on your presentation. And uh, as per usual, uh, our speakers have like 25, 30 minutes, then Daniel will take over, give some, some feedback, and then we open the floor for, uh, for our colleagues to share their views on or feedback and interest. As I said before to you, uh, we are very keen on obviously listening and hearing you what you have to say. We are keen on, on lifelong, especially on lifelong learning issues. This is a, an issue that we are working on ourselves uh, currently. So thank you very much for joining us today from Zurich and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. It's very nice to meet you all and I hope we can have a good discussion as you know as consultants I've of course prepared a couple of slides that I'm happy to to take you through but please feel free to stop and ask questions anytime as uh, as Ekehart said indeed I've been now 10 years with the, the Boston Consulting Group and in my normal day job I work with HR leaders CHROs usually with large companies we help them prepare the workforce for the future what talent they need where they find it how to retain it but now for the last one year, I've taken a bit of a, a professional sabbatical where I work with our internal think tank, the Henderson Institute, uh, where we pick up bigger topics that are not directly uh, kind of sellable to any of our clients, but we find that we think are very important for the state of the world in general. And I've been now researching you know, what's causing the global skill crisis, what uh, individuals, companies, governments can do to solve it, and you know, how one can leverage an ecosystem approach. That's where I would love to share some of our findings. And I'll be sharing the screen. Do let me know if you can see it. Looks good. Looks all right. Great. All right. So first of all, this is probably not going to be news to any of you since we all work in the similar field. Um, we did a little thought experiment to illustrate the severity of the global skill crisis. And by 2030, if we think of the world as uh, 108 people, actually 100 people would be today. By 2030, we will get to 108 people based on recent forecasts. The working age population would be divided as follows. There would be 34 people who are inactive on the labor market. Now, some of them, one could argue, could possibly be activated, but we are not quite sure of that. There would be four unemployed looking for a job. And then from all the other employed people, which was here the dark green, there would be at least 43 who need to upskill to stay competitive. And there would be 20 whose jobs are disappearing or they need to reskill to a completely different profession. Now, you probably know there are no kind of hard uh, estimates that can guarantee that this is the future that will come to pass. We basically triangulated a bunch of different forecasts from a bunch of different countries. But I think the consensus is quite similar. A good 20-15% of the workforce we are probably in jobs that may not be there in the future, and nearly everybody will need some kind of significant upskilling, and all this change is mostly driven by technology. Now, the problem with technology is that technological development has been on the exponential path for uh, the last 50 years or so. Uh, kind of as Moore's law predicted in the 60s, that computing capacity will double every year. It has actually been true to now, up to now. And now with the whole development of AI, chat, GPT and whatnot, who knows how that will change. But at the same time, the way people learn did not become exponentially faster. So we still need to take time. New skills uh, need some effort. We don't learn much faster, but change is much faster. And that's what essentially causing some of this um, skill mismatch that we are seeing. And why did we end up here? So why do we have 
more than billions of workers whose skills are not matching what would be needed. Um, we took a lot of thinking time about you know, what, what is really the reason. I mean, in theory, this, uh, this is a market, right? Um, companies would be willing to pay for certain skills. People can, in theory, develop those skills. So why doesn't the market self-calibrate? Uh, and uh, when we looked at it, what we found is the fundamental way we approach skill building has not really changed since the 20th century. But meanwhile, the environment we are in has changed significantly. And a little illustration. So if you think about the average lifetime of a worker and uh, kind of on the, on the vertical axis, a little bit theoretical concept, the value of one skills, which maybe we could define as kind of how much one is willing to pay for your skills or to what extent can you find a competitive job with the set of skills. The way it works is in the first 20 ish years of an average worker's life, we spend a lot of time stocking the skills. But even by the time we graduate, some of those skills are a little bit outdated. So we don't even build the 100% skills that would be in demand. But at least the first 20 years, we really properly focus on building a skill stock. But then what happens is then the value of those skills are decreases. One generation ago, the half life of a skill was about 26 years. So that would have meant that in 26 years, half of what you learn became useless. Okay, you still needed to upgrade your skills a little bit, but you know maybe you did a little bit of upskilling, a bit of learning a couple of times your life, and you would be generally okay with your initial skill stock. Now, the problem is latest research shows that that has dropped down to less than five years. So in five years, half of the things you learned is, uh, it was, is losing its value. And it's even faster in tech fields. Actually, tech skills devalue in two and a half years. So the problem is, in order to basically counter this depreciation, one would need to make a lot more effort. But then, you know, just illustratively, what happens today is people do make some effort, but there is a lot of research on how adult learning is not actually up to the task or not kind of the amount of effort people put in learning is not necessarily in line with how much, how fast the skills are depreciating. And uh, what's making worse is retirement age is becoming higher. So people would need a longer time to keep skills up to date. And something interesting we found is today, an average amount the government invests in the traditional education system. There are probably different ways to define this number, but it's around 4 or 5% of GDP. Now, the average amount of GDP an average government invests in adult learning is around 0.1, 0.2%. Again, this differs a lot by regions and so on. But there's a huge discrepancy of effort and time invested also by individuals. On the left side, we took an average 15-year-old who spent like 1,200 hours a year of learning. Now, of course, they are in school. That's what they do. That's nothing wrong with that. But then uh, various statistics points to an average adult spending only 35 hours a year learning. So it's really not great. And uh, to change this, significant paradigm shifts would be required. There is a lot, of course, that one should do to improve education. So that's on the left side. In theory, one could have more competitive starting skill set if education was more in line with industry demand, if education was more practical. That's not something we actually looked at. I think that's that's a whole research topic on its own. Uh, but then what we rather focused on is in theory, one's life would look something like this, where you make continuous effort to upskill, to learn new skills that is not a major change, but still, let's say you learn a new software or you learn, you improve your presentation skills. A couple of times in one's lives, one may change to a completely new field, which could be very different or could be slightly different. And then ideally upskilling would continue. But this is very different from what's happening today. The main reason or one of the reasons that this is not happening, what we believe is because the existing skilling systems, they are all set up for stocking. And they haven't really moved to the stage where they could deal with billions of workers needing significant up and reskilling. So companies, that's kind of our bread and butter. Of course, one could say, yes, employers need to step up. They need to invest in the skills of their workforce. And yes, they do. 
they are not doing enough, but even if they did, 70% of workers are employed in small-sized companies who don't even have a learning department. So no amount of stepping up from large employers will solve the problem by itself. Then academia, of course, in most cases, they are set up for kind of early age education. They're not necessarily ready for millions of adults going back to school. The way academic programs are structured, not really catering to people who may have to work in the meanwhile, even though it is changing, all of this what's on this page is changing. It's just not changing enough. Online education, yes, it's there. In theory, anyone could take a free course. However, still not everyone has reliable internet access. Completion rates of these programs are not great. Because of course, it's very hard to stay motivated if you are just sitting in front of a computer. So there are also challenges with online education. And finally, there are, of course, a lot of public and nonprofit programs. Governments do play a strong role. But overall, we find most governments are still a bit too passive. They don't invest enough. And often, public or nonprofit programs are not scalable or not sustainable because the next government launches different programs or because the funding for the NGO runs out. And then a joint problem is that all of these stakeholders, they don't collaborate strong enough and they don't focus on the whole skilling life cycle. And maybe one sentence of that, because that's going to be important for some of the ecosystems we looked at. So in theory, developing skills is not enough. One would need to make sure one building the right skills, so have some kind of proper forecasting where industry, academia, public sector works together to figure out what skills we should be even building. Then one could do the skills development. Then there needs to be some process to match people with the skills to the right jobs. And there are different ways of doing that as well. And finally, a good skilling solution would also facilitate the demand. Because quite often, for example, uh, some of our clients lacking people who would work in their customer service centers, but for whatever reason, they want to hire people who have master degrees. You totally don't need master degree for that job. But the demand is actually unrealistic. It's not matching the realistic supply. So in an ideal way, these different stakeholders would work together, adjust demand and supply, and provide people not only with the skills, but also access to the jobs and help them integrate and be successful. And maybe I skip the theory a little bit and coming more to the practice. So what we tried doing is um, our hypothesis was we are not it's important to look at how to modernize academia, how to improve corporate skilling, what incentives government should put in place. And we have actually looked at that. But we also think there may be some newer ways of addressing this problem, which we define as the ecosystem approach. So we try to analyze you know, innovative programs, coalitions, what we call a skilling ecosystem. And the way we define ecosystems is a group of diverse stakeholders, so usually academia, government, corporates, et cetera, who collaborate to develop and deliver skilling solutions, which address all parts of the skilling value chain. So forecasting, matching, managing demand, putting people in jobs, and that have an impact on a specific skilling challenge. Now, a lot of these are focused in a specific geographic area, but they don't necessarily need to be. And I'll give you a couple of different examples. So these are essentially special program solutions that are running outside of the scope of the current skilling program or the current skilling systems. And just checking if you already have a couple of questions. Maybe I stop and answer a few questions now, and then we can go into what actually I will share with you as we looked at 85 such ecosystems and then see a couple examples. Okay, so we have one question. Do you consider learning at workplace and informal learning? How do we distinguish this from formal learning? Great question. We actually run a gigantic survey of more than 200,000 workers two years ago when we asked them, how much time do you spend on learning in a year? And we run into this exact same problem is most people answer thinking it's formal learning only and less of workplace learning. So actually the difficulty in calculating the time, and I don't think anybody cracked this yet, is on-the-job learning is not something people would necessarily consider as the time spent on learning. So the answer is one should distinguish it, but at this point, I think most data sources do not. So that's something we would need to consider. Ideally, you know, when we look at um, how people should be developing skills, sometimes formal learning is actually much less useful 
much better would be to actually take a job that you want to do and then learn on the job. But this is not something one can really well measure. Actually, it would be exciting to do another survey asking how many new things are you learning in your everyday job. So long answer short, yes, we should differentiate it, but we can't really distinguish it right now in the statistics that we've, saw, we've shown. And another question, how do you see roles and responsibilities of corporate managers, school managers, governments with regards to boundary crossing and collaboration? Let me answer this at the end. I'll show a couple of examples where these different stakeholders were taking different roles, and then we can talk a bit about who should do what in an ideal case. All right, so going forward, so we looked at 85 models, early models of these ecosystems. Um, it was actually not so easy sometimes to define what is an ecosystem, what is just a regular government program, but basically these are all programs that involve multiple set of stakeholders and they are different from an average school course and they are different from a usual corporate education program. And uh, we categorized, you know, where are they, who do they address, who leads them. Maybe a couple of things to highlight here is um, it, there isn't really one stakeholder who usually leads this program. So we've seen programs led by government, by companies, by nonprofits. We'll share you examples from all of these. And you can't really say which one is more or less successful. It really depends on the context. For example, in Singapore, most of the programs are somehow government led. But in the US, most of the programs are nonprofit led. However, in Europe, we found a lot that were more corporate. So I guess it depends a bit how the labor market is set up and who feels more need to take responsibility. And uh, then we looked also at the time of launch. So a lot of these programs actually spring to life after COVID. Uh, so in the last three, four years, there have been a lot of initiatives trying to find different ways of getting people to jobs. And we'll elaborate a, on a couple of such examples. Something we found interesting um, we looked at different ways these ecosystem programs drive impact. So here you can see we did a deep dive on 30 of the 85 examples. I think this is about 30. And we looked at how many participants they reach per year. So how many people can go through the program or get a job or get upskilled. And then we kind of looked at how intense is the support being offered. That kind of zero is that there are a couple of online courses people can attend for free. And five is that they have basically, they have full support, accommodation, matching, integration, mentoring, personalized coaching. They are paid to do the program, whatever you can imagine. And what is interesting is a lot of these programs are still at very small scale. So, if you look at the yellow ones, there are a lot of programs very interesting, but kind of early niche programs where companies, government or academia came together and said, oh, we would like to develop skills. For example, you see this is a 10 times thousand tech for inclusion. It's a, it's a skill development programs for finance professionals who need much more digital skills. So it's very, very specific, small or pilot where a certain given population, either in an industry or in an area, like in Luxembourg, this project was run by the government, focusing on digitally upskilling workers in different companies whose jobs were a little bit threatened. But they never really go beyond very high numbers because they focused on a specific uh, smaller set of skills, smaller set of population. Then you have the blue ones, very interesting, and we'll talk about a couple of them that are very, very intensive programs and provide a life-changing experience to participants. Uh, for example, 42, one of the examples we look at, it's a, it's a very non-traditional uh, digital initiative in France, kicked off by a billionaire who realized they don't have enough tech talents. And it's a collaboration of academia and companies. And they basically build software developers from people who have not really even touched the computer before. So a lot of these are very transformational, very efficient. Then you have programs that actually at the larger scale, like the Skills Future in Singapore is a good example, which is a very comprehensive ecosystem with funding, incentives, different programs, different upskilling opportunities, where a lot of different providers, bunch of universities, bunch of training providers, different companies are part of it. And it's nearly works like an ecosystem of ecosystems. And I'll explain a little bit more what that means. 
And those initiatives, they can reach a much larger scale of people, but then they don't often provide that kind of individualized advice. And then we looked at a couple of ecosystems that are a bit more lighter in support, but reach much larger amount of people. I think the best example is the Microsoft Global Skills. Essentially, it's a Microsoft launched an initiative where they provide free up and reskilling to people around the world. And they work with local NGOs, local academia to have the right courses online. They work also with local employers, so connect people to jobs. Um, but in the end, it's an online program, so people may start it and then they may finish it or they may not. There is no you know, individual coaching or support kind of uh, looking after the participants. So anyway, what's the takeaway from here is, um, you know, what we were looking for is are the skilling ecosystem, kind of these collaborative programs, the solution to the global skill crisis? And the answer is that today they're not, right? They are very interesting, and we will see a couple of examples shortly, but they are a bit small scale. Only a couple of examples, especially the one in Singapore or the skill India, have proven that they can reach a really large scale of people. And there are a couple of couple of prerequisites for that, but it's a different way. It's a new way that if we add it to the existing systems, we may get different results. Let me maybe go to a couple of examples and then probably easier to, to take questions and have a discussion. So Singapore, this may be some of you familiar with, I think it has been often discussed as one of the best practice. So the Kiosk Future Singapore is a very locally focused, very comprehensive skilling ecosystem. And it's run by the government. So here the main stakeholder is the government who provides funding, they provide the strategy, they provide incentives for all the other different stakeholders to participate in this ecosystem. And you can see that it has elements that address all parts of the skilling cycle. And of course, where it starts from is uh, the government having a very clear understanding that for Singapore, basically the, the skills of the workforce is one of the main competitive advantage. So they really invest heavily. You know, they just a couple examples from this page. They run uh, various career conversion programs, corporate upskilling programs where they rely heavily on companies, but they also subsidize and incentivize them. They have a national skill forecasting uh, approach, national skill database, so people know what skills they need. They provide credit for learners. I think it's 500 Singapore dollars that they can spend on learning. They do campaigns. They are transforming the education. They provide awards, like whatever you can think of. So this is an example where the government basically enabled um, with very heavy upfront investment, a skilling ecosystem to form. What's interesting here is um, it's government run, but there is a lot of these elements are actually taken up and run by companies. So for example, RISE, you see one of the career conversion programs, actually BCG runs it. So it's a, it's a program where people in non-digital fields can upskill to digital careers. And this is a program that BCG designed and runs, but then in collaboration with the government. Then a very different example, 110 is a program in the US. It's an, what they call themselves an ecosystem of ecosystems. It's uh, an NGO, it's like a nonprofit who started it. It's basically a collaboration to support employment for black talent. And they work with 60 industry partners, 50 education and training providers. They are a nonprofit and they are able to place 17,000 people in a year, which is actually really large. And the program is quite fresh. It uh, only started since the Black Lives Matter movement. So in the last couple of years, they managed to grow to a huge, huge movement. And what they do is they provide opportunity for black talent to apply to be a, a member of 110. And then this program matches them with the right job, with the right training they need. Sometimes there isn't a job before they do a training. And then they also facilitate skill-based matching where the companies who want to hire from this program, they don't actually see people's backgrounds or their names or where they live, they only see their skills. So basically the program eliminates some of the bias that normally would be on the market. It does not only provide the skills, but also makes sure that actually the companies that hire based on those skills. And then they provide further coaching and anti-bias training and everything. So here, you know, the, the starting situation was of course, 
a disadvantaged group of talent who did not have access to the opportunities they probably could have had access to based on their potential, and the program acts as a bridge. A very different example, a digital school in France called 42. This is the one started by a telco billionaire who realized that they don't have enough tech people in France. So he thought, what is the most efficient, fastest way to teach people to code who have no coding experience? Uh, so 42 is an alliance of, again, employers who want to hire tech talent. Uh, the 42 school itself is an NGO and some academia who help them with content. And these guys, they have no courses, no teachers, and no classes. We interviewed them. It's quite fascinating. So they bring in a bunch of people who a lot of them have no coding experience. They give them a little bit of guidance, and then they immediately give them some exercise in software development and coding. And basically, they need to figure out how to figure that out. And they have more coaches and mentors to help them, like where you go online, how you figure this out, how you teach yourself to code. And then they need to work as a team and they rate each other based on their teamwork. And basically in a one and a half years program, people who have never coded before and the ones who complete the program, they have a 100% placement rate in digital jobs afterwards. And they are able to reach around 4,000 students a year. So it's very interesting. They basically completely deconstructed what we think learning means, and it works. And two more examples, and then ready to take questions. Don't want to take too, talk too long. Um, this one is led by uh, academia. Actually, it's government funded, but kind of academia is the main actor. Um, in the UK, uh, they have a network of what they call institutes of technology. Um, an institute of technology, if you look on the right side of this page, consists of a local college, like here, the Barking and Dagenham College. This is the East London Institute of Technology, a local university, and a bunch of large local employers. So an institute is actually an ecosystem itself, which has academia and companies in there. And then these stakeholders work very closely together to deliver different kinds of faster and much more practical technical courses. And you can see that these kind of tiny ecosystems, they exist in 12 places in the UK. Usually the, the leading stakeholder is academia, but there was a government investment. And in order to launch an IoT, these stakeholders need to come together and they need to apply. Then the government approves, okay, you are an institute of technology. So it's kind of like a meta structure on the existing educational structures in the UK. And then uh, they here have the courses are different. They're much, much faster. They're much more practical. Half the time of the course, people actually already work at the employers. The teachers are often from the employers. And also these courses are open to people who do not have even a high school degree or they are much older. So they are open to learners that these universities would usually not hire. So this is another interesting example, which is then led by academia. And uh, maybe I jump to the final one and then happy to share a couple more. Uh, maybe you know, some of you may know this one. <laughs> Joblinge in Germany is another structure. It's a social franchise. This basically started, uh, actually BCG was one of the founders, but it started by a collaboration, BCG and many other large employers. And it targets uh, disadvantaged youths, people who, let's say, either they could be immigrants, they could be, maybe they were in prison or they have uh, former experiences, they come from, from an orphanage, like they are starting from a situation where it's hard for them to finish traditional education or get access to the labor market. And what the program does, it's a six month program, <laughs> which includes coaching, teamwork, vocational orientation. And actually in these six months, people get placed at a local employer in jobs that you know one, uh, one would think people can do with no pre-requirement of skills. And then during the six months, they basically learn to do their job. So they don't need to know it beforehand, but they are also supported not only in their skills, but also in their lives. Yeah. So also on, you know, how to how to manage your finances, what does it mean to show up to work every morning? There's a lot more change management and, and personalized support that is needed when somebody's making a significant life change. 
And you can see this program is actually one of the oldest ones. It's been running since 2008, I think. Uh, the Joblinga Classic is for people from different backgrounds and Joblinga Compass is specifically for immigrants. And it's thousands of companies, thousands of volunteers who do the coaching, the teamwork, help these individuals. They also organize sports activities, cultural events. And they also have uh, public entities who sponsor them. So it's usually local governments, um, employment agencies. And it again works in 30 different locations. So as a summary, and then looking forward to discuss what works. So overall, Skilling ecosystems, they are still a little bit far from addressing billions of people, but they are an interesting way of solving skilling problems that kind of not solved by either large employers or by traditional academia. What makes them successful is if they have a very clearly defined, very relevant skilling problem, either black talent, disadvantaged youth, um, digital skills. It could be either demand side, as in we don't have enough AI experts, let's run a program, or it could be supply side. We have untapped pool of talent who don't have access to opportunities. But basically the ones that really managed to, to snowball were those that kind of address the problem that also had a lot of social support. Then the ones that are the most successful are those who cover the whole value chain as discussed. So they don't only do a really good training, but also do forecasting, matching, support, integration, coaching, everything. So those, the, the best ones, they manage to convince the employers to what we call it, to, to kind of move from competition to talent to co-opetition for talent. Which I have a personal experience here. We were setting up a similar program in Hungary to integrate uh, Roma people into large corporate jobs. And the three companies we managed to convince first were the three largest banks in Hungary that usually compete on everything. But on this specific issue, employ Romas, they were aligned and they didn't mind that they were sharing the same talent pool. They didn't see that as competition. They saw that as a win-win. Also, one more thing is to disrupt the traditional training delivery models. So in these ecosystems, they are usually much faster, much more practical. Uh, they don't have as many requirements as a traditional learning or training program would. And they try to kind of deconstruct what it means to learn a skill, and they just focus on what one really needs. And then finally, one could ask, okay, but and what's the role of the government here? And in some cases, we found that the government can really make a difference by enabling a supportive environment. I think Singapore is a good example. In an environment where it's very easy for companies to get tax cuts for hiring people from uh, different programs, where it's easy for training providers, again, to get access to corporate support, it's much, much easier for ecosystems to come together and people to play a role in such programs. In, uh, in other countries where the government is playing less of a strong role, we see this motivation coming from, from different sources, either a big billionaire investing or in the US coming more from the NGO sector. But you know, if we talk about how to make, how to let ecosystems grow, then for the government, there is definitely a role to play to put the right incentives in place so people would want to collaborate and hire talent from such ecosystems. So I think that was all. I'm very happy to, to have a bit of a discussion. And please be gentle, as I just mentioned to Ekehart, the research is still ongoing. And this is the first time I've actually shared some of our findings. So very interesting to hear what you think about all this. Oh, excellent. Thanks a lot. And this is really exciting stuff that you guys are doing. And I think that uh, already I uh, can see a lot of questions here. Uh, before we uh, hand over to the uh, uh, to the audience, I, I would ask Daniel to come in. And then for those of you who have posted questions in the chat, I think it's easier if you can repost them. You just copy paste them into the Q&A. That is easier for us to track. And and just because there was one of the questions, I mean, I I hope I, you don't mind also like that if you share sure. the presentation with, with our audience. So I will... I will uh, uh, send it around after the after the uh, webinar. So over to you, Daniel, for some comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Eckhart, and thank you very much for this um, excellent presentation on a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I don't think any couple of comments, uh, questions, not necessarily all uh, for you to answer, but probably also to inspire. Sure. Uh, can, can you hear me well? My internet was 
So, so okay, Eckhart, if my internet uh, collapses, I think you have to cut me off and take over. So um, maybe my, my first comment is on your point of departure, uh, the skills prediction for uh, 2030. Mm -hmm. I have to say I do not have a number, uh, but I uh, am always interested in where the numbers come from and the question for is how the challenge is. So 2030 is, a re is, is another seven years into the future, and you're talking about 5.5 billion uh, workers. So um, you would have to make a prediction about the industry composition in a lot of countries. Mm. Um, what kind of products and services are being demanded? What kind of skills do people have? I think it's, it's quite... Um, a daunting uh, prediction to make, and I just want to maybe uh, put the focus a little bit. It's 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 very uncertain, you know, uh, what what is going to happen there right. in the future. And uh, also, I think there was a little bit too narrow focus only on technology as a driver of mm. skills need. There are a lot of things happening. We have the geopolitical tensions. You know, there's military spending is going up, just to name one one thing that we don't know about what's going to happen in the future. Um, another big driver, of course, are demographics. Uh, you know, we may need a lot of people uh, in healthcare. Uh, you know, there are a lot of shortages of labor currently in the construction sectors, in low skilled. So I just maybe for the discussion to keep the you know the the scope a little bit more open and not only on this technology programming, uh, and that's the number of people that we need in in the future. So that's Makes sense. that's one comment. Another one um, on what I found very interesting was your chart on these um, on how we acquire skills over. Uh, lifetime you separated that into skill stocking and longevity i really like that part and i think this is really where the discussion that we need to have the term lifelong learning has ground for decades but i think the crux is really you know do we need to rebalance this and um I, so i really i really like that chart. also the 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 way you do you describe that we may have uh, people to go back to academia and really um, possibly completely change fields, which which means in the end we need more flexibility in people switching between jobs and training, etc. A little bit more than we do that today, where people, you know, let me put it boldly, uh, do an Excel seminar on Saturday mm -hmm. morning and that's it. Right, so that yeah. has to be a little bit more done. Um, but I have a question for you: Do you have any? knowledge i don't but do you have any knowledge about what kind of skills we should actually learn in the early phases and which ones later i haven't mm. so more concretely because i have in mind that there's probably some kind of hierarchy of skills so if you already have certain skills i think it's probably easier to acquire other skills uh one example uh if you have a good basis in mathematics, it will be much easier to make some changes later in the engineering field than when you if, if you start learning mathematics with 40 or 50 years old. The same for language, if you already language in the stocking phase, probably that enables other skills that you can acquire easier later on. I don't know if you have um, any knowledge on that. And my last point in ecosystems, I just wanted to um really ask uh, what is really new about i mean the, i agree with this we need this ecosystems and to rethink you know who has which role the governments um maybe chambers of commerce um schools etc all the all the actors that you mentioned but to what extent is that actually something new isn't that you know have not We've been looking at this issue for the last hundred years. You know, academia is not really meant to only prepare people for the job market, but it does to a certain extent. So we came up with the schools of applied science. Since we have the communication with chambers of commerce, uh, you know, go further back, there were the 
schools 200 years ago where also, you know, they had their idea about how to train. So this idea of the ecosystem, I'm fully, fully with you. Um, is that something new in the digital age or is it, you know, we mm. just have to update, we already know. Um, so they, those questions are not all necessarily to you, but th those were my reactions. Uh, thanks again for, for, for joining us and for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Very, very good thoughts. And I think I'm very much uh, with you on, um, you know, the lifelong learning as a word has been around for so long, but it's not happening. So I think it's, um, that's why we're thinking maybe there's a different phrasing there, or or it's very hard to pinpoint you know, what exactly would be needed to, to change the paradigm. And it's still, that, that's why we visualize in such a way that people are still first talking, and then you think you're good, but actually you are not good. <laughs> so what we need to do is somehow shift that balance and make it so that people can restock at any point of their lives. And um, on, the, on your second question, actually, the what kind of skills one needs? Again, I don't think I have the full answer. There's probably a hierarchy of skill. What we have looked into is um, skills have different longevity. And ideally, uh, each what we would recommend for each person is to try to balance kind of as if you were managing your wealth, like you have a different portfolio of some investments that are more risky, some investments that are less risky. You should think similarly about your skills. You should have skills that are more durable and can be useful in any situation. One calls this either durable skills or transferable skills. This can be stuff like project management or writing skills or, you know, basic maths, cognitive skills that you can use in any kind of job or even teamwork, collaboration, they are much more durable. And then you probably need uh, a bunch of non-durable skills, for example, using a specific software and those you need to keep constantly up to date. So it's probably probably a mix of that, but it's uh, it's hard to forecast which skills exactly. I think we what, so what, what we found could be helpful is for people to have like a portfolio mindset saying, okay, I have this kind of skills, that kind of skills, I need to have a full portfolio. And, you know, if let's say I'm a super good um, data science expert, but I have no people skills, maybe that's not good, right? So try to be a bit rounded individual because you don't know where you will end up in your life. Essentially for an individual now, we have to prepare for the completely uh, unpredictable future. So a bigger share of kind of transferable, durable skills one has, the safer you are in a way. And then on your last question, whether the ecosystems are new, I think not really. I think what, uh, you know, what we can say is, so what I found was interesting is uh, there are more and more, so we've seen in the last kind of three, four years, more programs popping up that said, there is a huge skilling gap here. Nobody's filling it. I will try to do something. So we see more and more solutions that are not coming from within the existing, existing systems. And uh, maybe that's a way, maybe that's kind of a way of leading to a movement. For example, I think this 110 is a great example in the US. I think it was founded by a couple of Wall Street executives who said, how can we give black talent access? And in two years, it basically grew to a really large ecosystem of companies, trainers, and they have placed multiple 10,000s of people. So I think it's um, maybe, I'm not sure it has to do with technology partially. For example, 110 actually has an intelligent matching platform that people can register and then it puts them in touch with the right training opportunity and the right employer. So technology does help, but also it's a little bit of a social movement, some of these killing programs where uh, you know, people start worrying about an issue and then it's easier to get them to line up behind. So I don't know, maybe it's a shift to kind of people and, um, and leaders wanting to take more responsibility as opposed to looking at traditional universities and the government to solve skilling programs. It's a bit early to say, but it could be maybe another a bit of a social movement enabled by technology. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so we have quite a number of questions uh, and we have uh, Jeff who has raised the hand. So I think I bring Jeff in and then I'll try to summarize maybe some of the questions that we have. Jeff, do you want to come in? No, thank you. Eckhart. Thank you for organizing this and thank you for the discussion. Um, I'm actually the deputy director for the research department. And last couple of days, I've been in discussions with productivity ecosystems mm. and we're doing discussions around the issues of skills. And where I, I think we have a challenge with this, we all say, you know, lifelong learning and skills. And, and mm -hmm. as Daniel kind of hinted at, what do we mean by skills? 
I think this has changed dramatically over the course of the last 20 years. So this is what I'd like to get your thoughts on. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we looked at most job replacements because of vacancies due to turnovers, not a lot of innovation. And in the last 15 mm -hmm. years, we've seen a lot of that change due to innovation. So in that initial chart you put up, uh, again, it was fine. But then if you start looking at innovation, what do we really need? And the traditional path often was, as you pointed out, was universities, we need people with graduate degrees, et cetera. But as you said, a lot of jobs don't require them. In the last handful of years, we've seen many uh, firms in high tech and also governments remove the educational requirements. And they're putting a lot more value on you know, learned skills, uh, demonstrations. Mm. So how, my, my question really comes, we, we use these terms of skills, we use these terms of lifelong learning, but I think we don't have a taxonomy to really define these. And it's changing very rapidly. Firms are now looking at real skills they need now. They're looking not so much at education per se, but uh, do you hold a certificate and as you pointed out in a certain, certain type of software or architecture, or have you done something in this particular area? So I think the challenge that we really have is what do we really mean by skills and what are we looking at in terms of you know, how we change? That all being said, the bigger challenge, I think, is how we are moving very rapidly, in my view. I know there's a debate around the uh, research community of how quickly we're changing the occupational mix uh, of certain industries. Mm. And do firms really know what they need now and in the next five to 10 years? I don't know if that's if you've done research in that area. That's where I see a big challenge. And finally, the last point we were debating with uh, some senior researchers that was engaged on the productivity issue, we understand there's a lot of difference based on size class of firms. Smaller mm -hmm. firms are much more adaptable. They shoot from the hip. They look at the skills they need now. Whereas you just mentioned in your research, uh, firms basically maybe have a learning uh, area within their human, race, human, research, human resource department. So again, I think there's a lot of questions around this. I think your presentation was quite interesting. I hope you'll share that with us. But again, my, my major question is, what do we mean by skills? What do we mean by lifelong learning? And how are we mm -hmm. going to deal with this, uh, these changes? So look, I'll throw those all out there. Then I have the bad news. I've got to run to another call here in 10 minutes. So Eckhart, I appreciate <laughs> you guys organizing this. But I would also say I would like to know the gender dimension because we are sitting here on uh, International Women's Day, but we didn't really touch mm -hmm. on So. Okay, thanks again for this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's really great questions. I don't think I have the solution either, as the what do we mean by skills is actually a huge debate. Maybe I just one um, you know one point on that. I work a lot with uh, with large employers. They are basically my clients, and um, very often what we hear is we should hire based on skills. So this whole story of skill based hiring, as opposed to hiring based on a degree or years of experience. Again, not new, has been out there for a long time. Uh, but most employers still really struggle with it. And why is that? Because exactly because of the question, what defines a skill? And you know, if you are a large employer and you can choose from 500 applicants for a job, then an easy proxy for skills is how good of a school a person went to, or how much was their GPA, what degree they have. And so you would just look at that and then you use that as a proxy for the actual skills. But if one thinks of skills as basically the personal attributes, characteristics that allow you to do a job, then it's much wider than, of course, what's on, on the paper. Uh, however, it's, uh, it's still a little bit far. I think a lot of employers are still far from actually being able to manage people based on skills. So the whole, so it's a little bit of a tangent, but another passion of mine, the whole area of human resources is based today on credentials, paper, experience, like things that you can easily account for. While in theory, and there are a few kind of uh, outliers who do this well, people should be managed based on their capabilities to do a certain task. And you know, in a future may be that um, once you enter a company, you have a list of your skills, which could be soft skills, hard skills, that you can play the piano, whatever it is, and then uh, that employer would just match you to the right task that's a good fit for your skills based on AI, technology, self-assessment, or whatever it is. And there are a couple of companies actually start going in that direction. So they deconstruct jobs, they deconstruct credentials and requirements, and people can browse so-called uh, internal 
um, skill marketplaces and then apply and basically just do the different tasks that fit their skill sets. But this is very much in the future. Definitely going that way, but most of our clients, most of the companies I work with are still still very, very far. But I guess, you know, if we were if we are encouraging people to build skills, we should be at the same time encouraging employers to employ people based on skills. Excellent. Thank you. So we have a question from Ken Chava, who is our senior uh, employment specialist in, uh, in Abidjan. And uh, and I think it's very much related also to another question that we have in the, in the Q&A. Hmm. Uh, Ken essentially wants to know um, how can we possibly ensure that we are not just developing skills that never may, may be in demand and, and probably related to the question on, on informal economy is, you know, I mean, a lot of uh, employment outside OECD countries is actually in the informal sector where you right. might not have these type of institutions that you were talking about. So how do you actually make sure that you develop the right skills also in the view of bringing people out of the informal economy into uh, into the formal sector and then obviously kind of training them into the proper skills? So if you can say something about that. Mm. Yes, again, I probably don't have the, if I had the answer, that would be great. But a couple of thoughts, you know, how to ensure we develop skills for what really is in demand. I think you can't. So what one needs to keep in mind, how do we ensure we develop skills that what we call are non-regret moves? So, you know, having um, ability to collaborate, ability to understand technology, the ability to learn. Also, for example, in this, uh, the, the French example of the school, they essentially teach people how to teach yourself to code and how to teach yourself new coding languages. Because whatever coding language you learn today will be totally different next year. So... I think one thing you can do, teach people a couple of skills that are more specific to the next job, but then teach people a lot of skills that are more about how to learn. And I think there are, I mean, there are still a few situations. Um, we practice what you call strategic workforce planning with our clients, where basically you try to predict what's going on in the industry for the next three, four years, and then you translate that to talent needs. But there are a few things one can see. So there are always areas where you think, okay, whatever happens, we will need some people to do this job or that job. And if, unless, you know, meteorite hits the earth, this job is probably still going to be there in three, four years. So it's always possible to identify a couple of non-regret moves. And beyond that, one can only try to prepare people for the unexpected. And um, sorry, on the on the second topic, can you can you remind the Eckhart what was the, the other part of the question? Well, I mean, the, the, key, the key point outside OECD countries is obviously that a lot of employment is created in the informal economy. Oh, the informal, so, yes. Yeah. Yes, I think that's actually one, one very interesting part of the conversation often gets forgotten. You know, when we talk about lifelong learning, I found a lot of literature is about, like, as a white collar employee, how do you spend more time on an online class? And that's actually not the problem of most of the people on the world. It's just that is not really considered. So actually for, um, I mean, I'm not sure it solves the problem completely, but some of these ecosystems we looked at in developing economies were doing a quite good job. So Skill India, it's, for example, a large program launched by the Indian government where they provide a lot of funding to um, employers so that they are incentivized to hire people who are kind of non-skilled or non-traditionally skilled and to local training providers. And then the government also provides an IT platform and where, uh, and then in, in different villages, different parts of India where people are actually in the informal economy, they have no formal skills, they have not finished school, they are you know, selling whatever by the road, they can walk into a physical office of Skill India and then they get the full support. This is the training you need to go. This is the job you can get. They can sometimes even choose from two or three different trainings. And they also have kind of local volunteers who then help them go through this transformation. So this is a very different program from, let's say, the, the fancy digital school in France. But actually, India is doing a really good job in reaching out to people in the informal economy and bringing them into employment through an ecosystem. It was a bit similar what we did in Hungary with the, the Roma integration program. Again, we had a lot of participants, and BCG was one of the co-founders who were not formally trained, not employed, kind of in a situation where if they had applied with their CV, no company would have looked at it. But because they were coming through the program, they actually looked at it, and then they went for an interview, and then the HR person recognized that based on their personality, they can actually do the job. So I think in these cases, one needs a really, really strong support system. 
And I mean, in theory, you would have the, the employment programs that the government has that should be filling those roles. But what we found is the problem is those programs are quite often not really connected to the real work demand. So in these cases, uh, additional um, programs, which actually employers are already in the program kind of made a difference. Excellent. Thanks a lot. I think we are almost at the end, but I had, there's one question in the Q&A, which I find particularly important from the perspective of, of the ILO, which is on the role of social dialogue and social dialogues mm. institutions, so trade unions, obviously, but also business associations. If you can just maybe conclu uh, conclude your uh, your remarks on, on that particular point, and then uh, unfortunately, I guess the time is up, uh, and uh, we uh, would like to uh, hear you maybe some final kind of reflections on what you have said to uh, what you've told us today. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thanks a lot. So, yes, I think definitely what was, I, th I think one of the main things that makes current skilling systems ineffective is the lack of dialogue. Basically, schools are building skills that the employers don't need. The employers are expecting people to come out schools and they don't come out with those skills. Employers don't collaborate with each other because they are kind of, you know, jealously hoarding the couple of talent they manage to hire. So there is really a lack of dialogue and a lack of coordination. And definitely there is a role for the ILO, sometimes the government, sometimes independent uh, expert bodies to step up and say, guys, you need to talk to each other. Basically, there's a lot of effort going somewhere, but it's not going in the right direction. And what is also a little bit missing is, is the trust between the different stakeholders. And uh, I think there is uh, there's definitely a role of social bodies to build that. And also a lot of trust is missing from the individuals. Why should I spend years of my life doing this program? What do I get out of the end? But if it's a program where I know that at the end, the employer is waiting for me because the training is 100% aligned with the employer needs, then I as an individual will also trust much more. But there is definitely a huge, huge role for better coordination, for building trust, or bringing frameworks, bringing structure into making these different uh, stakeholders collaborate. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> right on target at uh, four, uh, four o'clock. So thanks a lot for being with us also. Yeah, I mean, this was great insights. And I mean, we are really much lo looking much uh, forward to the to the final results of your research. Do not hesitate to reach out to us if we can be of any support for your research. I think that there's a lot of people here in the in the, uh, in the call that would be interesting to learn more about this. And as I said, if you, if you with, with your permission, I would uh, be happy to share the presentation with our participants today. And with that, I wish you and all the women on the call obviously inter happy mm -hmm. international women's day it was great to have you here and i hope that we meet uh, very soon again in this format or another one thanks a lot thank, and you, thank you very much, much. To all. thank you thank you please if you know of any such ecosystems that i haven't listed reach out to me because we are always collecting more examples we will thanks a lot thank you very much thank Goodbye. you have a good afternoon bye thank bye -bye. you